you've reached FIT TV. Stick around, we'll be right back. I've been laid up from work, my rent is due. My kids all need brand new shoes. So I went to the bank to see what they could do. They said, son, look like bad luck got a hold on you. But it's too tight to mention. There exists an unlevel playing field for litigant child support payers in family courts. Obligors are punished, even jailed, by unfair judges' decisions. The courts know of the injustice to child support payers, but there's no recourse. The payees happily take the money and run. The payer then fights for the justice they rarely receive, and the acrimony just, just continues to go on forward. It is really an evil way to do business. It is within the courts where the self-leveling exists. Off the backs of the unfair decisions by judges made by child support payers is the only way that this whole thing works. Feeding the bureaucracy is a uh, unlevel playing field, but that's where the money is going. It's going from the litigants to the, to the court system, which treats its, li its litigants and its people through the system extremely unfairly. I have with me to discuss the issues about being, uh, having redress or having no redress on my left, Sean Devlin, a disabled support payer. And on his left, in the far corner of there, Glenn Sabota is also, uh, you, are you disabled as well? I know no, you're a not, support, no. Support uh, payer, though, that's under duress, that's yes. for sure. Yes, it's Okay, correct. you're gonna assist us in helping us with that part of the program. Um, Sean, just so we, people can get a little, uh, an idea of what's going on in your life, tell us what happened in your case, what's going on. Uh, basically, my experience with the child support system has been very adversarial from the very get-go. Uh, I got divorced in 2001, and I immediately, through the Child Support Enforcement Bureau and through child support rulings, I was immediately hit with a very, very high amount of child support, uh, $420 a week as a temporary order, which eventually became permanent. What, was it based upon uh, an income that you were able to make at that time? No, ap actually the support magistrate based it. He imputed my income. He disregarded my joint filings, my tax returns that I filed with my wife for the past five years prior. And he just basically made up a number. Mm -hmm. And when I explained to, I actually tried to mediate the situation with my wife, my ex-wife at the time, because I owned a business and I knew there was no way I would be able, my business could survive. Within a short period of time, I quickly fell in arrears. I quickly lost my business, and I ended up uh, basically going bankrupt. Would you, what was the relationship to you losing the business and, and the court orders for an imputed income uh, or an excessive imputed income? There was, there was basically, it was impossible for me to pay off the note for my business and meet the child support obligation at the same time. And then to compound matters, I had a CDLA license, which I needed to run my business and child support because I fell into arrears, saw fit to suspend that license, mm -hmm. basically ensuring that I had no way to continue with my business any further. Mm -hmm. So my, when I pleaded to the judge and to my ex to reconsider, that I was more or less told to uh, find a different line of work. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of on my own. What transpired from that point was I had a series of injuries, accidents, and surgeries that left me fully disabled. And I found no sympathy or no willingness for compromise between either family court or did, from my Did ex. the court deem that these uh, disabilities that you uh, entered into evidence were beyond or past the date of your divorce or the, uh, the paperwork processing for the divorce? Because there's a obvious situation the court will take advantage of that well, what I found mainly of the timing. What I found mainly was when I tried to bring the documentation and the medical evidence that I did have uh, different circumstances in my health and my ability to pay. 
there was always an excuse between the family court official or the referee or judge that invalidated the paperwork or documents I brought forward. It always seemed that there was always something else required. And the problem with that was in between trying to provide the right documentation, there was always a four to six month delay mm -hmm. in the next court appearance. Sure. All that time, I'd be building further and further in arrears and further and further into a hole, which yeah. <clears throat> realistically I have no way to dig out of. Hmm. Did you have, uh, how many kids do you have? I have two boys. You have two boys, okay. And um, how do they, or how do they, how old are they, first of all? Uh, 14 and 10. Well, they must, they're old enough to get a view or to report or give an opinion of how things are going. I what, would have to say, that? honestly, uh, my experience in child support and visitation custody matters, my children's voice has rarely been either acknowledged, requested, or they really have. What about to you personally? I mean, how are they responding to you personally? Are they on board? Do they understand that the there's an injustice going on? Are they um, hesitant or reluctant to, to join you in your complaints? What, what exactly is going on with the family? Well, due to the fact that I have extremely restricted access to my children, there is rarely any time where I have any unsupervised or unrestricted contact with my children. And this wasn't something that I believe that this was tailored by design to be that way. When I do have an opportunity to speak to my children, uh, to be honest, the, the very last thing I want to talk about is family court mm -hmm. right. or, or anything that right. might be perceived as trying to form a wedge or anything against the mom. Because at this point, after 11 years being restricted to one hour a week with my children, there is nothing I would want to do to jeopardize that one hour. Mm -hmm. uh, they're at the point where they're old enough to make up their own minds if there's, if there's an injustice. It was one of the reasons why I brought that up. Um, children after 14 are generally allowed to make a decision on where they want to stay and where they want to live. Mm -hmm. Of course, if they're in a, in a largely different area with a different school district, that won't be so easy. Yeah. What's happening? Well, the there's been two occasions where my children, it seemed that they would have an opportunity to really play a pivotal role in how the case proceeded forward. And it was a very painful experience for me because I realized very quickly that it seems that there is no rule or no efforts that aren't great enough to make sure that I don't get ahead that will be engaged by my ex-wife. Yep. When my oldest son was set to testify before a forensic evaluation, I, I was really very confident that finally some, some of the he said, she said talk would be put to the side and my children's mm -hmm. voice would be heard. And basically two weeks before the evaluation, my son was placed on heavy duty psychotropic medications mm -hmm. and everything he said was more or less dismissed as being inconsistent. Wow. Just, um if I can, I want to just back up a little bit. <clears throat> you know, obviously, uh, we met Sean through Families in Transition several uh, months ago, <clears throat> maybe almost about a year ago, and he was going through some traumatizing uh, effects in the family court. Um, and it, some of the issues that he was raising, that he was on disability and was still paying the high rates of child support. And uh, obviously, the courts will not help a non-custodial parent uh, to try to give him the proper information. What was happening was Sean was paying like a, uh, a non-injured person, somebody who was not on welfare or disability. And so he was playing, paying regular standards like as if he was capable mm -hmm. of working a full-time employment, which is going on in this county on a regular basis and has been going on for years. So we spoke to Sean, we told him of his legal rights and he had to go out and fight you know, the, this system and uh, to try to say, hey, listen, you got it. This has to be a cap on my child support. I, I can't be paying you either two, three hundred dollars a week. I'm on disability, mm -hmm. and and it's such a process that if somebody is not there to tell these people, nobody out in that family court or the Department of Social Services 
will do that because they will lose mm. income coming to Canada. So Sean was trying to get visitation for his children, but he was going through facing going to jail. They take away your driver's license. I mean, you're, you're living like sure, a third. Once, once you're entrapped, you're a victim. You're a, a victim of the state. Yes. And the state can apply whatever measure they wish to to get get what they want out of you, which is probably what unjustly what many you know, people that, that we know have done. You know. But there's a a recent change. So the, the good news is in the future, and, and we're hoping that this program will go to the source for me to help. I have a year of somebody at the state level that might be able to help us uh, get redress for dis disabilities or things that are unreasonable, because there's no change of circumstances going on here. That I mean, there's a tremendous amount of change of circumstances, but nothing that the state can really handle effectively. Well, I mean, uh, you know, my opinion is, is that this is old news. This is something we fought about in Families in Transition over 10 years ago. I mean, the, the judges go to school, they, they go to the uh, up in White Plains, they go to the, the Judiciary Institute, they're taught these things. They're just, they don't want to bring these things up. You have to present it like you're on a murder trial. And uh, I, I mean, I said today, some of the people in family court have more paperwork in, in, to try to defend themselves from child support or family court issues than some murder trials. Right. You know, <laughs> it, it's, uh, they already know, I believe mm. they do know, so it's... Uh, we just have to be out there to watch them. So what, what do you think that uh, the, the children, going forward, let's go back to the kids for just a moment, what do you think is going to happen to them going forward for you? Is there any possibility that, see, there's no joint custody law, so you can't just step back in and say, you know what, let's have a shared parenting, let's share this, this parenting going forward. I mean, has your wife changed her perspective, uh, remarried, or what has she done? Um, my ex-wife is actually remarried. She has another child with her new husband, it's, it's very uh, painful and difficult for me to actually say, but after 11 years and seeing the lengths that my ex and her new husband were willing to take to ensure that I never regained any of my rights, I had to make a decision to step away. Not for mm. me, but for the, f the safety of my children. Mm. If a person is willing to drug, intimidate, threaten, and harm a 14-year-old child just because he wants to see their father, I have to step back and say to myself, what kind of danger am I putting my son in yeah. if I continue to push forward? Yeah. Well, who, what, what, who kind of, what kind of danger might they be in if, if someone's going to go to the extent of putting them in psychotropic drugs to get them to be evaluated at that time? That's another. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what risk is worse. I think not... This is, this is not something for everyone. Uh, you're faced with a dilemma that's life crunching. Sometimes you need to fight. And I'm not asking you to fight because sometimes you need to withdraw. I completely get where you're at. You're in that middle, middle of the road. The system makes you do something, doesn't it? It's gonna make you either go forward or go backwards. You can't, nothing will ever be exactly the same. I would place upon the feet of the court the unrealistic reality of a judging a child under drugs or an unfair assessment there and, and try that approach and go into that with all, all guns blazing because that seems to be an unreasonable expectation to come out with a normal representation of the mental health under psychotropic yeah, drugs. I, I, I question just a tremendous amount of the uh, psychologists, school, uh, the schools are doing it, trying to medicate the children. It, it is a new business and uh, <coughs> I, I it always question, you know, uh, psychologists uh, that would uh, mm. want to give uh, children medication and because we, we've been following this so long and it's uh, to me it's uh, uh, it, it's not a good direction that you know we're going in this industry mm. of control and families uh, yeah it's the state is the other party as we talked about yeah, the state they're the ones that they're, they're the ones that are promoting this you know the the, the parents you know they sometimes go along with it but uh, you need that we need to have dad involved in these children children's lives because we're, we're able to take care of some of the, sometimes the other parent has psychological problems and they pass it on to the children, and, and, but that's, they want to keep that out of the equation uh, pretty much, at least I know pretty much in New York State and, and mainly Suffolk County, mm -hmm. they're just not interested in visitation. Enforcement. Yeah, we should call it access, by the way. I don't use the visitation to criminal. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, We're trying to get that to change. Yeah. Uh, if if, if I can, you know, sure, take in what, what you said makes sense to me, and I would, I would have to agree with that statement. If you were dealing with a system that really 
wanted to hear logic and the truth. But my experience has been that family court will look in one direction and they will refuse, in my case anyway, to consider any other possibility, whether it's by design, convenience, I'm not sure. A they want you to use person, the system. They want you to go to yeah. the appeal, the lengthy and laborious process that's unrealistic. <laughs> Less than five percent yeah. of the cases are overturned. They want you to go through that appeal system. You know, spend I, more money on the on the legal aspects this, of it. This state is so broke. This county is so broke. You'll hear both the Republican parties and the Democrat parties never mention cutting money from this system. Well, uh, the, the child the support court. system they'll, is a they'll cash cut cow. They'll cut the schools. They'll cut the police department. They'll cut the hospitals. They'll never mention because both parties have their hands in the pocket okay. of this family court system. That's why it's the biggest silent kept secret. But almost everybody in your job or where you work with is going through this. Yeah, and this is why we do what we do. Absolutely. I mean, this is why I'm here. And, you know, what you said about Democrats, Republicans, if anyone was ever to take into account how much taxpayer money has been spent, in my case alone, in oh, 11 sure. years, it would be mind-boggling. I hear a lot of people say, well, family court really doesn't affect me. What happens over there has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. If people had a comprehension of how much money is being wasted, taxpayer money, for, for matters that could be mediated, resolved with common sense I, logic. I have some newspaper articles, and, and some of the rule of thumb was that the counties would spend anywhere from 4.5 to 5 million dollars to collect every 250 thousand dollars in child support, and and that's why there's so many union members involved making big. But there's judges that have been retired for over a decade making over 300 thousand dollars a year in Suffolk County. I mean, you know, how many people are getting rich off your children in this county? Yeah, as long as we keep falling prey to it. This is why we're hoping that if if uh, a family would recognize that if the children were more important. Uh, placing the children in a system such as the one you fell through would be a no-brainer. So the, the, the people who watch this program are getting the idea, well, you know, that would be a big mistake to have to go to a court to try to find out where my child is going to yeah. be. And that I can assure you with yep. and I, everyone. To have, have you seen some of the same-sex uh, marriages or unities? I, I mean, you, you have, I, I just seen a, a case where it was two same-sex women and then the, uh, uh, the one woman had uh, uh, been inseminated by one of the neighbors <laughs> and then the two, the two same-sex women wanted to get divorced or separated, and then all of a sudden there's three people yep. that are involved in visitation. So it's now you're having non-biological uh, parents involved in visitation. So this is turning out to be uh, probably one of the number one losses uh, you know, for the taxpayers. Yeah, well, paternity is, is one issue. No, no one's really presented that issue, but the same, that's another story. We can get to that on another True. day, but the same-sex issue is another a whole other yeah. ball of wax. Just a mess. That's Does right. your ex have any kind of recognition to what's going on for you? Or is it a design to bury you? I mean, do you think about just her representation in this matter? My, my personal belief is because there's almost, I was speaking before the show, uh, it's almost like my ex has a cocoon around her between people, whether it's friends, family, lawyers, where She's been told it's okay to do what she's doing, where it's acceptable to behave the way she's behaving. I don't think there's any consideration or even acknowledgement of what this process is doing to me, to my children, or even to her own, to her own personal well-being. Because there can't be anything healthy, spiritually, mentally, no, emotionally, no. when you know you're causing pain to another individual. Uh, unless there's a, and I don't understand that, to have that much vindictiveness to somebody, to create some more pain. Uh, I, I, for instance, was in a sim similar situation. You had an imputed income issue. When, uh, after my child was 12 years old, he decided to, to live with me. It became too much of a problem for her, so he came to live with me. And it, I, re I remarried. And my wife was very, very upset that I didn't do the same thing to her that she did to me. She, she put me through the ringer and had me go through all kinds of hoops and barrels and I had to deplete my uh, retirement account and reduce myself to nothing also. But in that process I decided, you know, someplace the buck has to stop somewhere. As it was a choice I made, kind of like your retraction from the system if you think about it. It's another decision that walks, walks back and says I'm the better man for it. Right? I, I mean you I, have to leave yourself that 
vision of your children looking at you as a better man is fine. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. There, there is, there's nothing more that I, I would like in life than for my ex-wife to be happy, her new husband to be happy, for us all to get along. There, there's no reason for anyone to try to hurt anybody. Whether or not that makes me the better man, or I, I don't even think like that. I know for myself, the emotional burden that this caused on me, and we spoke about suicides and yeah. fathers losing hope. Yeah. Where this process took me in my life, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to be sitting here today, even able to have a conversation. So I, I don't want to sell my soul to try yeah. to try okay. to win or prove anybody right. That was a choice you're making, and it's a, that was a choice reasonable I'm choice to make. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a sound way to decide. You know, just in your situation, how long have you been dealing with? I'm going to show you an example in a second. How long have you been dealing with your court, family court issues? Um, I, well, probably about oh, 15 years. My 15 years. Yeah. And you are, you're in it for 10? 11 years. 11 yeah. years. I was in it for about 8 or 10 years myself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the public, John Q. Public out there looking at this program, may look at us as extraordinary. If I just use the years aspect alone, it's a little extraordinary, 10 years. That's, a little, that's more than a little extraordinary. That's a removal of your soul for that many yeah. years. You're a changed person forever. Yeah. The system doesn't really deal with this in a transitional state. That's why right. we're families in transition. We look at this thing from right. an institution change. We see this picture and this pattern going on that we, see, we now see the disjointed elements in children going forward. We now can see the psychological deprivations created by having only one parent. Yeah. Uh, the failure of the state not to enact a, child, uh, a um, joint custody law is a very serious issue. If they would given you the option, maybe your wife, wife might not have chosen it, but if you saw with the premise that a, a child support, I'm sorry, a, um, a joint custody issue is available, well then it's something to head for. Right. But with nothing to head for, you're a non-custodial parent. You're a damned parent. Yeah, the, mo the money equation has to come out of it, but at this point, there is so many people employed in this system that it would be a, a catastrophe for this government to eliminate the uh, the family court and or the child support uh, enforceable. If they did have the presumptive shared parenting bill, both parents would get the children half the time, unless one was at the fault, mm -hmm. which we have right now. Always somebody's at the fault here most of the time. But Yeah, it was a failure of the law yeah. to say that they're going to take so much money out to supply an equal state of that child living in, in an existence without that father that you could pay for, somehow pay for that person's the children's existence and then also pay for yourself that was a fallacy in the law yeah. and you know I looked at the Child Support Standards Act it's a mess and the debate was very very odd the federal government had the money and opportunity to say to the state all right you take this on do this because right, if you don't do this you're not going to get the money from the federal government that's why we have that Which crazy law roads. that's right and, and, and that, that that thus is why they always impute or you know uh, overcharge child support or child support arrears and they don't even want to emancipate your children. It's, it's, a, it's another a disaster. How far do you think in the future your kids are going to go in this state that they're in now? And do you find them healthy? I have some uh, very grave concerns about the psychological well-being, especially of my oldest son. And you had stated earlier that, I believe you said at 12, you gained custody of one of your children. 14 is the magic bullet age, but 13 and 12, when they're very responsible and very mature, right. a judge can make a decision. My kid came up, uh, lived with me when he was 12. I, I could, I could very, very easily see in the future uh, my oldest son, my, my ex-wife and her husband not being able to cope with my oldest son. And then mm -hmm. eventually, hopefully, I'll be there to try to help pick up the pieces. Yeah, uh, so you should, this is a, a tentative stage for you. Uh, one where uh, making the wrong decision could be a, da a dangerous thing. Now you've been in that deprived state for such a long period of time without the balance of your children's lives with you that maybe you can see that going forward you may very well have a decent opportunity to reacquire that yeah. child in your life. There's, there's nothing more I would like. I mean, I try, all I could honestly do is prepare the way I feel mm -hmm. and have everything prepared for my children when that day does come. Another way to look at it is that your, your ex-wife had the boy for a certain number of years, although it's not legitimately a joint custody, it's better to have that debate of, of parenting skills when the parents are together. It's okay to argue now and then, but to uh, have it miserable is not. But that if you were to get the child in the remaining number of years, at least the kid would benefit from your value at that point. 
One of the things that I do feel I'm very fortunate for is even though I have my relationship with my children has been restricted beyond even, even normal circumstances for family court, my children and I are very close. And it seems that nothing was able to break the wedge or the bond between me and my children. I know there's a lot of parents who aren't as fortunate and who have lost all contact, communication, and relationship with their children. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very lucky in that aspect, and I'll just have to wait for the day to come back. Yeah, you may have to. Uh, in this last couple of minutes, uh, what would you say that uh, your, your choice would be going forward for yourself right now? I mean, what would be a plan of action? If you had to present a plan of action to someone, would you say, do you have an idea other than to remain in status quo, or you know, what choice do you have? No, actually, I, I, took, I tried to take some of the negative that transpired in my life through this family court process, and I had heard Glenn mention earlier about psychologists, and my involvement with family court, I've been exposed to a lot of uh, bad reporting by psychologists. I decided to gain a degree in psychology to perhaps be there not only for my children to pick up the pieces, but for other people's children as well. Mm, I've obtained good. my associates. I'm headed for my bachelor's. The ultimate goal is to go, obtain a Ph.D. Mm -hmm. and work with children, and, you know, for psychological counseling. That's, that's a great goal. If, if you yeah. were to um, look at us as, uh, I mean, you have to consider yourself an advocate. I, I've known you for a while. I know you're an advocate against how the system works now, and you are too, Glenn. Um, what would you say an advocate can do? Is it a good idea to be seeking an advocate? But, you know, you don't forget, you're, you're talking, telling your story to people out there who never never met you and don't know anything about you. So they're hearing your story for the first time. But you want to, in case they go for a divorce, what would you say is a good idea? Is it a good idea to reach an advocate, not reach an advocate, call an attorney, not a call? What would you do? I think the most important thing and the most important thing that I wish had happened with my experience was that I had met someone who's been involved in this before the whole emotional collapse took place with me, the, this process has led me at times to wonder whether or not I was, I, there was actually something wrong with me. Maybe I was losing my mind. Yeah. Because you can't believe what's transpiring. You know, I, I kept trying to look at this process from a logical standpoint or to try to understand how it could be happening. And every time I tried to dig further and try to understand it, I just became more confused. So if somebody was just entering the process, mm. I would strongly encourage them to reach to somebody who's been through this process and to let them know, yes. listen, things could get very dicey. They don't always work the way they should. You need to be prepared for this. And the one this could happen. One bit of advice I would collect as we're ending the program here is that if, if you went outside the system to seek an advocate, as you're suggesting, would be one thing. The second thing right behind that, running alongside it, we to go through the mediation process because it's such an inexpensive process. You get to settle your issues with your ex before you can get to litigate. And in, even if you get to litigate, you have something started that stops the litigation process from being way too expensive. Absolutely. Th thank you very much, Sean Del Delavan and Glenn Sobota. I appreciate that. This is uh, an excellent program, and I hope that we can pass this information along to the state and get some of these laws changed. Societal and political trends are rapidly breaking down the family that once was the cornerstone of our great American culture. At FIT, we know you cannot get this information on your own, so we'll bring it to your TV every week. We always invite all opposing views. My name is Chris DiMaggio. Thank you very much for watching FIT TV, and we'll see you again next week.